You would think with a name like Space Gun, I wouldn't really need to do that much explaining. It's a gun that shoots things into space. So, yeah. To be fair, the mechanics and history behind these things are actually quite a lot more complicated than that. Or, at least I'm going to say they are for the sake of a video. But first, orbits. You've almost definitely had orbits explained to you, even by me if you're willing to go back far enough. I would not recommend that, but it's worth me going over them again in this video, as it does come up later. But this time, we'll do it through a thought experiment known as Newton's Canon which revolves around a cannon thought up by Isaac Newton. There's an awful lot of this in this video, isn't there? The experiment starts when a cannonball is propelled sideways by a cannon, and, to quote Newton himself, the thought experiment continues as follows. The stone is made to describe a curved line in the air, and through that crooked way is at last brought down to the ground, and the greater the velocity is with which it is projected, the farther it goes before it falls to the earth. We may therefore suppose that the velocity be so increased, it would describe an arc of 1, 5, 10, 100, 1000 miles before it arrived at the Earth, till at last exceeding the limits of the Earth, it would pass quite by without touching it. Or, to paraphrase in modern English, if we had an imaginarily huge and powerful cannon, in theory we could fire a cannonball further and further and further, until eventually it moved so fast sideways that the Earth's surface would curve away from it at the same rate that it fell. Thus, it never actually touches the Earth's surface, it would just go around the planet forever. This is the theory behind orbits, and we know they work. You can impart this velocity in numerous ways, either through gradual chemical reaction like rockets, or in bursts of nuclear energy, as in Project Orion, or all at once with a more literal interpretation of Newton's cannon, an actual cannon. And thus, that method is known as a space gun, a massive cannon or gun that is so big and powerful you can launch projectiles into space, or maybe even orbit and beyond. And following in a long line of scientific concepts named after not the first person to come up with them, you may hear a space gun be referred to as a Verne gun, following its use in the science fiction novel From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne, which would be a perfectly nice name in any other circumstance, and I would use it. But Space Gun is just so much cooler. I mentioned briefly in From Earth to the Moon there, but speaking of works of fiction, Space Guns appear in other media you may very well have heard of. Not only the book that I just referenced, but also other books and the video game Soma, which apparently also has one of those things. This is supposedly the second time I've covered something Soma related, and I still haven't played it. Or maybe even more likely than that is the loose film version of this book, from 1902, Le Voyage dans la Lune by Georges Millier. It's been referenced in so many things and so much pop culture that it wouldn't surprise me at all if you recognised this creepy moon face. And the firing mechanism for the capsule was, you guessed it, a space gun. So, media is all very well and good, but you can do pretty much anything with that. What about the real world? Could we build one on Earth? Hmm, that is a very good question. I'm not so sure. This is one of those videos, by the way. There are a number of problems that a working space gun must overcome to, well, work. It's a thought experiment, after all. We'll start with the most basic and work up, though we might be here a while. Yeah. Most basic it is. Experts in astrophysics and avid Kerbal Space Program players have probably already noted a flaw in the space gun being a stand-in for Newton's cannon. In the thought experiment, the titular cannon is on what some call Newton's very tall mountain, which puts the cannon already at orbital altitude above the atmosphere, and it's just a matter of going sideways. For a space gun, which presumably is mounted near to, or on the ground, that is an issue, because you can't really orbit two meters above the planet. You need to first get up to altitude, and then accelerate into orbit. According to the laws of two-body gravitation, it is impossible to get into orbit from the surface with a single kick. You need a secondary one after the gun is fired, but in the long run, that's manageable, even if it kinda does defeat the purpose of a single acceleration cannon. So, what else is there? Yeah, if the cannon is on the ground, and that ground belongs to the Earth, the gun, or more specifically the projectile, has to contend with the atmosphere, air resistance. And if the cannon is fired on a suborbital trajectory, it will have to be going really, really fast to get the height for a secondary burn. Actually, being general and saying really, really fast lessens my point, don't you think? Okay, we'll do the maths and work it out, using this thing, which outputs the initial muzzle velocity of the cannon, and plugging in the height, 
let's say 120 kilometers, which puts it well above where space starts, and the angle of the cannon at 30 degrees, which is reasonable considering how orbits work through sideways velocity. Finally, introducing all the Earth-related numbers, we get an initial kick needed of 3,042 meters a second or 6,804 miles an hour, which is the speed the projectile would need to be going out of the cannon to reach 120 kilometers altitude. And that in no way allows for the fact it would have to counteract resistance from the atmosphere, meaning it would have to be going significantly faster, maybe even two, three, or four times faster than 180 kilometers a minute. I know that was quite complicated, it was kind of rocket science after all. So to balance that out, here are some cats. However, it doesn't take an advanced level in mathematics to tell that an object slamming into the atmosphere at that speed isn't really going to fare too well, especially if that object isn't a shell, but an intricate satellite weighing many, many tons. I mean, this is going over four times the speed of a bullet inside the densest part of the atmosphere. That's some force. We could, in theory, negate these two points by mounting it on, say, a space elevator, but then we'd have to talk about fancy ways of counteracting the force. So, okay, say we develop a very, very, very aerodynamic shell for satellites that can cushion cargo. It's not really that extreme a leap. So, what else do we need to deal with? Yeah, because accelerating a mass like that to well over 3 kilometers a second takes quite a bit of infrastructure, with a barrel which could range from a fraction of a kilometer long to dozens of them, depending on propulsion method and estimate you use. Linked to this is... Because firing many tons to kilometers a second really isn't that easy to do inside a cannon. We might have to use a comparison for this sort of thing, as it is easier to explain, so who in history has built massive superweapons? Yeah, it was only really a matter of time before I brought up the Nazis. The V-1 flying bomb and the V-2 rocket are weapons fairly well known by the majority of people, but what that 55% may not know is that there was a third V-3 weapon in development towards the end of the war. It wasn't a groundbreaking, literally, suborbital rocket or a weird winged bomb thing, but instead a massive cannon. Way bigger than other massive cannons built by the Nazis, and over 80 meters longer than this one you also may or may not have heard of. This Vengeance 3 weapon, nicknamed Fleissiger's Lysian, or Tausendfussler, for its appearance, has such an interesting story, it's perfect for an explained video. So expect one coming of that. It's one of the only times I actually say a story for another time, and mean it. For today's purposes though, we're only interested in the barrel, that consists of many, many explosive chambers in a staggered formation, that detonated one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, to push the shell with each, gradually, to very high velocities, and would have been predicted at its peak to be able to fire projectiles 165 kilometers away, ideal for bombarding those pesky allies. This is all very well and good, but what we're interested in is this multi-chamber design that has been tested to be beneficial, and if we want to build a space gun, we may also wish to implement it. But this isn't the only out-of-the-box, non-traditional barrel design we could use. Instead, we could construct a very short, theoretically infinite, circular barrel and accelerate to the necessary speed on that, before letting go and launching into the suborbital trajectory. This would negate a barrel length of potentially many miles that would need intense structural support or submersion in water to stay up, but does lead in nicely to another problem we haven't yet discussed. Which is problematic if we're talking about infrastructure, but even more problematic if the thing we want to send into space is human. Because, well, humans are fragile. This graph shows us the maximum sustained force when a human is optimally seated, and is around 10 g's, or 98 meters per second, squared. If you want to get up to that velocity with this acceleration, you will need a barrel 47 kilometers long. So you can see if a space gun were to be built, it would be for satellites and not people, because space guns need to accelerate a lot faster than that, and if there were people on board that capsule, they wouldn't be people by the time they reached their destination. And all of this doesn't mention and other problems that might be faced when building, using, and reusing this thing many times. So you'd think with all those problems, it would be silly to even try to attempt to... to do the... Oh, 
Now comes the historical part of the video, and this part is the story of Project Harp, Project Babylon, and Dr. Gerald Bull. Jerry Bull, I think, was big on the whole firing things very fast in the atmosphere thing, and from what I can tell, was actually very good at it. To simplify hugely, Bull managed to lobby the US and Canadian governments in 1961 enough to create Project HARP, or High Altitude Research Project. So, Project Project? Which was basically a way to test models of prototype, quote, re-entry vehicles. Instead of a hypersonic wind tunnel being constructed, it simply fired models of missiles, or whatever, from high-powered guns, which was way, way cheaper and more reusable. However, from what I can tell, Bull's end goal when dealing with this tech, and also apparently his passion, was instead to develop a gun capable of firing satellites at suborbital trajectories, hence why the test site wasn't in the wilds of eastern Canada, but on the island of Barbados, 13 degrees above the equator, where any space gun fired eastward could best take advantage of the spin of the Earth, meaning they didn't need as much power as they were already travelling at roughly 400 metres a second. It's no coincidence that they were fired in the same direction as rockets departing Cape Canaveral. They're both taking advantage of the same thing. With construction of the massive guns finished in 1962, they were slightly delayed by potential nuclear warfare, but by the 20th of January 1963, the gun fired its first. A 315 kilogram slug with a muzzle velocity of a kilometer a second. The next day, they fired a small rocket from the same gun, dubbed Martlet 1, which in later forms could give the secondary kick needed for orbit. And with that, they managed to reach 26 kilometers in altitude. By the end of June that year, they had broken records with the firing of a Martlet 2 type rocket that reached an incredible 92 kilometers in height, rivaling the V3 in altitude. It was looking good, with more guns being built and the Barbados gun being extended to become the biggest artillery piece in the world at that time, with a length of 40 metres. But, just as they were making headway, the government that funded them were encountering significant bureaucratic pressures, and there was turmoil from both Canadian and American backers. Soon the project dissolved, as Canadian university backers thought of the project as too militarised, and the United States government opted to fund missile technology instead. But, just before, Bull had time to build another Barbados gun in Arizona, and test fire that one, with the gun producing a world record. It managed to fire a Martlet 2 at 2.1 kilometers a second, and to an altitude of 180 kilometers, or 80 kilometers, into space. It's a space gun, though not one that could yet get into orbit. This record still stands today, which is great, but may tell you something about how this story ends. After the collapse of Harp, Gerald Bull managed to save the infrastructure built up over the past decade, and in 1967 he founded the Space Research Corporation, which in the next decades continued to research space gun possibilities, as Harp had done before. The SRC also took on contracts for artillery pieces. One of these contracts was for the South African War against Angola, which was a bit iffy, as there were embargoes on that particular government because of its horrid apartheid system, basically meaning that you couldn't really deal with them, and there was trouble if you did. Because of this, Bull got indicted, whatever that means, and jailed for four months, in which time the SRC was liquidated, whatever that also means. The story of how this actually happens is a lot more complex, involving ships, shipments, the Pentagon, a guy called Jack Frost, and others, but it really isn't space gun related, so we won't go into it here. It isn't black and white, but it is interesting and rather time consuming. I do recommend you go forth and do some personal research. This four month sentence really angered Bull, as he saw himself as being mistreated and betrayed. Not giving up on the space gun dream, Bull was soon freed and reset up the SRC in Brussels, the capital of the artillery world at the time, where he continued his work and continued his military contracts for foreign powers such as China and Iraq, which probably wasn't good for someone who doesn't want to get assassinated. He also continued his own research into superguns and space guns. His colleagues said one of his strongest points as an engineer was to take something old and rework it, and this he did with the old reports on the Nazi Vergeltungswaffe or in English, Vengeance 3 weapon, as well as the other guns to develop his own modular gun barrel, bigger than anything else. He estimated for around $10 million, you could build this massive thing and bring launches into space down into the thousands of dollars, not the millions or the tens of millions. The cannon was to launch a rocket, which would ignite at a certain altitude and then travel the rest of the way into orbit, thereby solving the Newton's cannon problem we discussed earlier. 
According to some sources, he approached the Pentagon, but they turned it down. But in around 1988, he found a government that did not turn it down. The government of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And so began Project Babylon, a project based off work done in HARP and the SRC and his plans for a space gun to build an absolutely massive gun for the Iraqi government, with multiple iterations, though only two were built, dubbed Baby and Big Babylon. Baby Babylon was 46 meters long, weighed 102 tons, and was basically a prototype for Big Babylon. But even so, when fired at 45 degrees, could be expected to go over 700 kilometers and also therefore into space. Big Babylon was 156 meters long, the barrel alone weighed over 1,500 tons, and the internal diameter, or the bore of the gun, was around a meter. Both of these guns were modular, that is, made of sections that could be bolted together, much like the V3. Here's some video taken by me of one of the sections of Big Babylon. And yeah, it's bloody massive. The barrel was built in the UK, the framework and supports in Greece, the recoil system in Switzerland or Germany, and some of the breach in Italy. From there, they would be shipped to Iraq undercover and assembled into a gun that is estimated to have the ability to fire a half-ton projectile a thousand kilometers or a two-ton rocket maybe into orbit. It is doubtful it would have been used for orbital rockets by Hussein, seeing as it really couldn't be aimed and converting it to house those sorts of rockets would hinder its military potential. Furthermore, it had the same flaw as the V3. It couldn't be moved and likely would have been bombed pretty quickly if operational. But doing this for one side of a conflict doesn't really make you the best of friends with the other. And in this particular case, those people were the people in range of Iraq's supergun. And so, on the night of the 22nd of March 1990, as he entered his flat in Brussels, he was shot by a team of people five times from point-blank range. Experts think his death was planned and professionally orchestrated. It was an assassination. Many to this day tie his death to the intelligence agencies of Iran or Israel, who were under threat from the gun and sought to make sure Bull didn't complete it. 600 people attended his funeral. Bull was such a fundamental part of the project and kept so much information in his head, when he was taken out, the project fell apart. Saddam Hussein would never get his supergun, though he did get some other insignificant by comparison arms that were also part of the deal. Soon after Bull's death, parts of the Project Babylon barrel were seized at UK Customs, who had been tipped off that instead of being for a petrochemical factory in Iraq, as said by the manufacturers, it was actually a weapon system. Those eight pieces remained in the UK, and even today, you can visit them in museums. This section resides in the Imperial War Museum in Duxford, in Cambridgeshire, with no sign to actually mark what it actually is. On the same note, you can go to Barbados, and the Project Harp guns are still there. They haven't been used in a long time. Whilst Big Babylon was never even assembled or working, I think it was the closest we came to an actual real working space gun. And so, that is the story of space guns, of Project Harp and Project Babylon, and of Gerald Ball. And the only thing left for me to say is thank you for watching.